this session is really to get a, a sense from some of Africa's leading investors of the risk and return in Africa, right? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Moonshot by Tech Cabal. So I think I'll come to Maya first. And the reason what? for that, <laughs> I think um, if you think about Africa's role and the perception of Africa globally, if you talk to a lot of investors worldwide and ask them about investing in Africa, many of them might tell you they're not quite ready yet. And Maya, you've, um, you've had a long kind of history of interfacing with international, international investors. You know, now you obviously run ventures, uh, excuse me, aggressive with, um, you know, kind of the $50 million new fund. But years ago, I think 2016 and before, you were bringing investors, international investors on tours of the ecosystem. So I just want to come to you first and get your sense of, you know, your perception as you interface with investors across the world. How has their, you know, affinity, their perception of risk in Africa changed over time? Do you notice any, any change? So this response is more guided toward founders or team members who are positioning for or trying to raise from global capital. Um, I would start with how things began long, long ago. I'm one of the tech ancestors. I started about, I think this will be my 10 year anniversary. Don't ask me how old I am. Um, and when we started out, you know, I started this in like 2014, 2015, like straight out of college. And when we started, there was maybe $20 million that came into all of Africa for venture capital, the whole continent. You know, in 2016, there was, what, 129 million, 2017, 560 million. Um, it's been a long road. And when we started out, I always tell this story, we were, as, as you mentioned, we were recruiting investors from Silicon Valley mainly to come to the continent to invest in African tech. I'd originally started trying to raise from Africa-based investors, but people were like, you want me to give money to somebody with no revenues, a young person, Yahoo, Yahoo, probably not. And so I was like, who are the most risk-tolerant investors in the world who have started from scratch, who have started as those young guys, dropped out of university, built businesses, sold them, they get, they get it, they really understand. And so went to Silicon Valley and was going literally door to door, knocking on VC funds and technology companies' doors and refusing to leave until I got meetings. And these guys' initial questions were more along the lines of, how will there be developers in Africa if the literacy rates are so low? Or like, is there really internet across Africa? Like they had no idea what was going on. Absolutely not. And so to see the transition to today, where the top funds, you know, Carry First is one of our portfolio companies, and to see their Series A extension led by Andreessen Horowitz, arguably one of the top investment firms in the world, and Bamboo, another one of our companies that was led by Graycroft, and just seeing the development over time, where now if you are not aware of the technology ecosystem in Africa, you are the ignorant one. It's been a long road. I can say though, I'm so, I'm most excited about the opportunity for people to outreach to global investors via social media. And this is for everyone in the audience who's hoping to raise from global investors, but based here, go on LinkedIn, go on Twitter, start generating content, tag your favorite investor, say something witty, say something insightful, become known as the subject matter, ex subject matter expert in your specific area or vertical, and you would be surprised by how many unique cold leads you can get off of social media. We have an analyst that has more connections in Silicon Valley than I do who's never been there because he's a fantastic social media personality and constantly generating useful and insightful content. So use your devices. You don't have to go anywhere to do so. And just to um, follow up on that, with uh, Maya saying use your devices. Just want to make sure that you, you all use your devices here. And if you have any questions, uh, submit them with the, uh, with the software solution. Uh, because we'll ask some of them directly. So please do. Um, so I want to come to you, Illumide. Um, just in sense of kind of understanding a bit more for our, our audience. And thank you for you know, ha helping us understand who's in the audience, Maya. 
But uh, for Illumina, I want to get a sense, you know, from you, you've had a kind of strong, you know, angel investing experience, right? And you now are in the fund management world. So I want to get a sense from you as you think about kind of risk and return from your perspective, right? So I think it's kind of different as an angel investor, and now you're on the VC side. So just what are some of the, you know, how are the two worlds different in your view? Okay. Um, and nice, thanks for the question, and it is nice to be here talking to founders. Um, like Maya, I started investing as an angel in 20, 2014. It was those days where you could do 25K to 50K for 15% for 15 in, in a company. Uh, but then there was nobody to follow on because um, outside capital wasn't just coming in. And as an angel investor, I always had this saying that I can, use my, I can lose my money only once. Um, and so I could take bets and bet on founders early. I'm usually the first check in, in most companies. And it's, at that time, it's focused on the founder. Like if Shola of Paystack had come to meet me, he was building something in the health tech space or logistics, I would still give him money. Um, and you do those kind of deals and you get to see more deals. Obviously, as we had our pay stack moment and ventures started coming in, getting uh, investors, traditional investors who had invested in other asset classes found angel investing to be interesting. So I started getting comments like, hey, Olumide, next time you're investing, you're 100K, I have 50K, let me, let me follow you. And I called a few, a few people to, to do that. Interestingly, um, I think the education around how to invest and in venture capital or in, in startups um, as, a high, as a high risk asset was not appreciated. So I'll give you an example. I invest, one of my egg bonds decided to invest with me in a, in a company, um, in a betting company. I think I put in all of maybe 60K in the company. He even put lower, about maybe 15 or 20K. And the company, like every venture, every startup, prone to failure and the company died. And he came to meet me and said, how, oh, Olumide, so what will happen now? I'm like, what do you mean what will happen now? Money don't lose. <laughs> so people didn't appreciate the risk involved with venture and just see all the good stories, or all the exits. Um, so angels like us started to educate that, hey, there's still, this down, there's still the downside, although, yes, the upside can, can be very interesting. And with that upside that we had, it made people then say, Olumide, I want to invest alongside you. So I set up Voltron Capital to take my money and other people's money to then get more capital to startups. And it changes the way you then look at deals. Um, before, I would, like I said, I would look at the founder first, which I still do. Um, but now you have to bring in more things around market products, but still keeping the core focus on, on the founder. And also then understand, before as an angel, it's my deal, I'm not reporting to anybody, but now you have um, investors you need to report to, you have fiduciary responsibilities you need to take on. And the upside though is that you're able to get more capital and um, to, more, to more companies. And it also helps um, when you're running a fund because you can say no easily to family members because you can say, oh, I'm running a fund that I can't fund you. So that's on the flip side. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I think it's, um, it's actually very interesting to get uh, more of the uh, investor perspective, right? So if you're a founder, you're, you're trying to raise funds from an investor. As Olumne mentioned, investors have bosses too, right? So there's limited partners that investors get their money from to invest in your company. So to that point, I want to come to Olivia at the end um, with VCAV, which to me is a very interesting uh, VC firm on the continent. And for VCAV specifically, it's a it's a, mer it's a partnership, a joint venture between Varad, a private equity firm in Nigeria, and Keppel, which is a, a VC firm that's very active, that has strong ties to Japan. And as a result of that, or in my view, as a result of that, a lot of Keppel, VCAV's LPs are, you know, Japanese institutions. So you have SBI, you have Toyota Shuso. So I just want to come to you and, and kind of get a sense, you know, as you're thinking about you know, Africa investing in the perception. Just what, what are your LPs saying? What is the percept, what's driving that attraction 
among Japanese investors to what's happening on the ground in Africa? Thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, as you said, a lot of our LPs are from Japan. And actually, two weeks ago, we had our first annual LP meeting uh, in Lagos. So a lot of them came to Africa, came to Nigeria for the first time of their life. And surprisingly to us, they were not afraid. They were positively shocked by the opportunities here happening in the country and also uh, in the continent. So we took them to our portfolio companies and had really deep conversations. And when they engaged with the entrepreneurs, what they left saying was that we were really impressed by the energy and passion about building sustainable, lasting companies, not only in Nigeria, but maybe potentially could be global companies from here. So that also speaks to the fact that in economies like Japan, it's not growing. So for them to see the growth speed of companies and industry here, it's very um, shocking, but also very exciting for them. So when it comes to risk, uh, risk reward metric, I think there are more, knowing that the risks being there, they are more excited or incentivized about the upside that they could not have achieved in their own economy. And I think that's not only limited to Japan, and maybe we've seen some Southeast Asian companies, Chinese companies also come into the continent and try to um, work with entrepreneurs here. Thank you for that. And I think um, it's good to have that perspective at a macro level, but I'll come down to the micro uh, for Delapo and the Ventures platform. And just so, again, as we know, the audience is a lot of founders, people who work in uh, tech companies, people, I imagine, who have aspirations to become founders. So I just want to get your perspective, Delapo. If you're a founder trying to get, you know, uh, trying to raise funding, you know, all, as uh, Olumide said, most, you know, that betting company example, most companies will fail, right? So uh, knowing this for a founder, what should they keep in mind in terms of presenting themselves to a uh, VC? that makes the VC look favorably on, uh, you know, on their risk-reward profile? Thanks, that's a really good question. I think in this climate, um, it's hard to, to raise money um, right now just because of you know, the macroeconomic situation. Um, yeah, we just don't know what to expect. So I'll say for this climate, it's important that what you're solving for is a huge problem that can provide outsized returns. It's always interesting when we have to like explain that concept around returning the fund. So for a $50 million fund like ours and Ingressive, um, to return such a fund, your revenues need to be a lot um, and outsized, um, given that we only have a proportion of your of, of the company. So that's one thing. Um, another thing, because of the macroeconomic situation, I'll say um, showing some form of traction and showing the huge growth potential. So if you think around the devaluation of the Naira, this year alone has been, I think, 40% inflation rate of 25%. So to even grow, to be not negative, you need to be growing at like 65% year on year. And so I think just thinking around the fact that you're getting dollars and you're using, you're earning money in Naira, just thinking around how much you need to be growing by to, for us to be incentivized to invest in your company. So we're always happy when we see um, from a risk profile, you're getting some form of revenue in foreign currency um, of late in the last like six months. When we're reviewing um, founders, one of the metrics is actually is there any um, FX exposure? And, and that's like one of the significant metrics um, here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's Can I just do some quick math just yeah. to make sure that people actually understand yeah. what this means about fund returning? Yeah. So just so everyone in the audience is aware how we're thinking. So when you come to the table, you can, be, you can add this to your toolbox. So say, yes, as, as mentioned, there's a $50 million fund. Every deal that we invest in should be able to return the fund, as in should be able to make $50 million net that comes back to the single investor that is on your cap table, one of them. So just think generally about how big your business has to get. And this is why I always say 
venture capital money is the most expensive money that there is. Because work, let's work backwards. So say in pre-seed, I gave you a $100,000 check at a $1 million valuation. Or say that I, I own 10% of your business, OK? Think about, and, and subject to, to dilution, when we make that initial investment, I, we initially target 10%, we, we anticipate there will be about 75% dilution. So dilution means our ownership will decrease the more money that you raise. So say by the time you exit, we own then 2.5% of your business. What total revenues, and say right now we're in a down market, so conservatively, maybe it's gonna be five times revenue is your valuation. So what revenue would you have to get to in order for $50 million to be only 2.5% of your business upon exit? That's like a lot of money. So just be thoughtful about that. You know, it's sometimes this tension of like, why are you trying to take ownership of all my business? In order for us to remain in the market and be sustainable, we ha have to give our LPs money. In order to keep investing in venture capital funds, we have to sh show that we're generating returns. Similar to you guys in this contracting market, it's all about generating revenue. Investors are like, cool, 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 that's really great. You know, your vanity metrics and number of users. What's your bottom line? How much, not just revenue, what, what's your net? That's why we care so much about those things. So help us help you and make sure to think about that when you're coming to the table raising capital. No, it's a very good point. And I think um, I'll just underline there the points of uh, what's your revenue and then what's your uh, bottom line. And I'll go back to what Delapo said in terms of, you know, in this environment, and Maya as well, in this environment, you kind of have, um, if you're earning dollars, if you're earning money in Naira, right, your bottom line, your revenue is just decreasing when it comes to uh, reporting in USD. So, I, so that's one of the currency risks. One of the risks of investing in uh, Africa, and Nigeria specifically, is that currency risk. Others have been mentioned around, you know, product risk, execution risk, uh, management, people risk. So I'm just curious to, to all of you, just as you think about, you know, the risks of any single investment, is there any that you have in the back of your mind? We obviously have a lot of stories about bad actors these days, like Dash and Ghana Float, where people have apparently um, done some things with the money, but are you thinking about that? Is that a primary risk for you? The, the founder is going to run off the money? Just what risks keep you up at night? Okay. Um, I think once you invest, right, you accept that things and some things can go out of control. But you don't expect someone to go out of control. Um, and in some cases, like we've seen, some people have have gone out of control. And I think there's enough blame to, to go around on, on, many, on both sides, even from the founder side and even from the investor side, in the sense that um, some investors have ended up backing bad faith actors due to FOMO. So because you want to be in the deal, by all means, um, you know this guy is a jerk, right? But you still, you still go ahead and, and back him because he's hot and everybody's backing that startup. And, some due diligence is, is not done. Because sometimes, right, you see certain stories, and you're like, there are smart people in the room, right? Uh, smarter people than you in the room. So, and you hear all the commentary on social media, people commenting on deals, like, these same people are smart people and, and didn't see. So sometimes it's very hard to model bad behavior. How do you model a guy going to Ghana, spending three months in Kepinski Hotel with baddies? <laughs> How do you model that? What Excel sheet can you, can you model that in? That's just a bad faith actor, right? Uh, or you can't go back and find out, did he do it before? Some people want to um, eat breakfast before they come to the table, right? They, they, they already want to spend that, that bread before it's ready. Um, so you can model some of those things. But I say it in my point of view that it comes back to the founder. Um, I'm backing a founder because... I'm expecting that the founder has taken a risk on himself or herself before I take a risk on you. You can't be working in bank A and say, I'm building this startup as a side hustle. When I raise money, I would leave. You're not ready to jump and take that risk, but you want me to risk capital on you. Um, so it starts again with the founder. 
when I'm investing, I'm optimizing for the upside, right? You're not, I mean, you think about the downside, but venture is really optimizing for the upside and what happens if this looks good, especially in the bull market. Today, um, as a consequence of funds obviously slowing down, and which is very good for our environment, more diligence is being paid, corporate governance is now, is now and more investors are now sharing. Um, I call out a bad founder or a supposed bad founder in, in, in a book because I heard the founder was going to raise again. I'm like, if investors talk about these things, bad faith actors would not get an opportunity to keep doing what they are doing. In some of the in stories we've seen in recent times, those same founders did wrong, but nobody talked. Every investor didn't want to be seen that I uh, was the one that <laughs> they used your head. They didn't use your head. You can't model those kind of actors. And that's why I feel that sharing um, about some of these things becomes very important. Thank you. So this question is for you then, Mike. So you have this uh, 54 gene that goes into a rocket ship, very high, highly valued, goes to zero. So just curious, does that change how you think about um, you know, due diligence, valuation, risk, reward, or is it just, you know, it's part of the game? <laughs> Choosing my words very carefully. Uh, no, I, I think that there are many different ways that a company can fail. And just because something goes to zero or runs out of money doesn't mean that the founder was nefarious in stealing and doing terrible things. I'll leave it at that. And I, with all of the companies in our portfolio, when there is something that happens, I don't point fingers until an audit has been conducted and a trial has been held. And that's within my portfolio and outside my portfolio because it can also do a lot of irreparable damage to the ecosystem at large if we hear some gist and then we take that story and then make it fact. And that works in personal life, professional life, on and on. So it's just something to be thoughtful about in that altruism of we want this ecosystem to succeed. Let's wait until we have the actual facts before we start spinning stories. Now, to answer your question, there have been a number of instances inside our portfolio and outside of founders going out of control in ways that are legally bad, in ways that are frowned upon, in ways that are like, wow, that sucks, and I don't know what I would have done in your situation. Now, we are more thoughtful about, at the beginning stage, making sure that we have financial controls, as in oversight and guidance. Because a lot of this, what I'm realizing, is people who just don't have financial training, don't have accounting training, haven't done projections, don't know how to manage burn right, those sort of practical things. I can help you with <laughs> babes in the Kempinski. That's not my problem. <laughs> but outside of that, there are so many founders who, you know, you you start your business, you're really good at product. You, we've, we've optimized in the past for product people and technical people, maybe some marketing people. But how sexy it is to optimize for an accountant on the cap table. I mean, accountants in the audience, I love you, and now you're my friends. Now I'll call you. But historically, that hasn't been the most important part of a startup. Even a CFO, like, why are you a pre-seed company and you already have a CFO? Unless you are doing lending, et cetera, doesn't make sense. So now it's definitely changed the way we're thinking about initial company construction, and it's definitely helped us with our 100-day plan. So when we first make an investment, we help the company with, the, we're very active the first 100 days. We try to help guide them, help with additional investor relationships, help with biz dev, help them get their licenses and regulation. So definitely being thoughtful from that part. I'll leave it at that. Got it. Thank you for that. The other question that, um, that I was asked to ask the esteemed panel here is about um, the, the reality of uh, achieving kind of a billion dollar exit in Africa, for example, right? So I think a lot of founders, a lot of people, the ambition is to build kind of a highly valuable company in short order, get to $100 million in revenue, sell for a billion dollars. If you look at Africa specifically, um, a lot of, or many, not all, but many of the exits that have happened from Paystack, DPO, et cetera, I think Sendwave are in that bucket of 200 million to $500 million. Uh, you know, but I think a lot of people 
model for these exits of a billion dollars and invest based on kind of that. I'm not saying you do, <laughs> but a lot of people uh, kind of do. So just, I guess, the, the question specifically is, like, you know, from your head nod, my, just how, what do you guys model for in terms of exits? How realistic is a, um, you know, a billion dollar uh, company? Is that something you guys are looking to invest in these days? That's why we are always intentional about creating that bridge between our strategic investors, some of whom are listed internet companies from Japan or Asia, to work with startups early on so that they can establish the trust that later on they can consider acquisition. Because as you said, a lot of exit does not happen as IPO, but more in the M&A uh, activity. So I think at the beginning of our fund thesis, we wanted to be that bridge, and that's how we ended up in this structure. I'd like to add to that. So I think Biola was here earlier on, and we were all in Oxford um, two weeks ago for you know, lots of African VCs there, and everything we were discussing was exits, and just the reality of the African ecosystem is not necessarily going to look like Silicon Valley, which is, was how it started. And so now we were talking around innovative ways around exits and what that looks like. And we actually all concluded that that $1 billion exit is probably not going to be the norm. And so how can we, um, as VCs, start enabling exits in other ways? So whether it's portfolio companies merging, um, whether it's even different instruments, so maybe looking more into convertible debt um, because we have to show things to you know, the LPs. So yeah, I, I think when we model it in our investment memo, when we share it to IC, it's actually not always $1 billion exit. Some investments are made because we believe the path to exit can even be in like three years at like 300 million. And at that point, it's less risky. So yeah, I think that's... I would say, yeah. And with what we've noticed in recent years is the time from launch to unicorn in Africa has meaningfully contracted even in comparison to other ecosystems. Like the first one took 17 years. And then how long did Jumia take? And then how long did Flutterwave take? And then how long did some of these other players take? Chipper Cash, not sure where valuations are now, but how long did it take for the most recent wave of unicorns to get from zero to launch? It's about on average three and a half, four years. So just think about that also. So, the, I mean, the future is bright. And also, I'm just coming from UNGA, where we were meeting a lot, we were meeting with a lot of uh, liquidity providers, like uh, public markets, international public markets, who are really excited about Africa's potential to launch on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, et cetera. So the future is bright, things are growing, people are really excited. Now, for us, we don't even have a billion dollar exit in our portfolio. We are actually, like our strategy is to come in very early, the pre-seed deals, the, you know, our fund one, one our fund one was 75% of companies were 5 million post money valuation or below, and 60% were 2.5 million post money valuation or below. So very early, I mean, post traction, et cetera. So all of you early stage companies who don't think you're relevant for aggressive, come talk to me after. In any case. We're investing really early, so the multiples that we have to get to in order to return the fund or return a meaningful part, chunk of the fund, we don't have to reach a billion dollars. It can even be an early 100 million, 200, 300 million dollar exit. We're anticipating less failure, because also in the African tech ecosystem, there is a lower failure rate than other markets. So far, at least we've seen from our portfolio and other portfolios. And so less fail. And of those that fail, may not be 10,000x or 1,000x, but we're going to get a solid chunk of 100x, 50x, 20x, 5x companies. That's how we are constructing our portfolio. We started out modeling um, some of these companies the wrong way and copying some, some maybe some, I won't say bad behavior, but copying some things that were not particular to our market. I was speaking to a, a, an investor from Silicon Valley and you'd find that certain companies at the height of the bull market, certain companies in Nigeria, were being valued at the same stage and valuation as a company in a big market like the US, right? 
So we were already paying the premium valuation um, for, for companies that weren't necessarily at that stage, um, especially because it was a bull market, right? So I finished YC by default. It's $20 million post YC valuation. Which from where? Where is, where is that going to happen? But think if that founder had raised that $3 million, right? And then... Um, there's an opportunity to exit at 20 or 24. That's still an 8x play. It's still meaningful. But you've raised that 20 million to get to that 8x play. You need to build a $160 million business. How many $160 billion business exist in, in, in our market? I can remember when Main One had that exit for $300 million, and people were on Twitter were saying, ah, it's too small. I said, do you know what it is to build a $300 million business and exit? So because we got carried away with all the big numbers, we, we, didn't, we don't tend to appreciate what it takes to even build a $50 million, a real $50 million business. Because it's one thing to be valued at $50 million. It's another thing for someone to want to pay and buy you for $50 million. Um, because that's when, you really know the, that's when you know the real value of that cash. So I think we need to, and I guess that's what this PM market allows us to, to recalibrate some of this um, plays and come down to earth because once we do that, we can start seeing some of the mergers and some of the quick acquisitions because there are certainly acquisitions that will happen in the market today if companies were valued more sensibly. You, you mentioned um, kind of one thing, which is just the, the risk to of founders who kind of value their companies a bit too aggressively. Right, especially if things go uh, wrong, and there's a lot of reasons to feel gloomy right now about you know about uh, business in Africa. From uh, Nigeria, um, there's currency uh, deflation. A lot of companies are going uh, out of business. There's layoffs, and etc. Uh, but I'm curious, um, just what keeps you guys optimistic as investors? You kind of have to be, you know, a bit of optimist to kind of say what's the upside despite kind of what I see, despite the high risk of failure. So I'm just curious. Um, for Olivia, for Delapo, for uh, you know my Illuminate, just why are you guys excited about you know the rest, you know Q4 and then 2024? We take long-term view. We don't want to be restricted by what's happening sh in the short term. Like people are saying that, some people are saying that don't invest in Egypt. The currency, the FX, the macro is bad. And our view is that if you look, if you take a slightly longer term view, the fundamentals are there. The population, demographic, and also the diversification of uh, economy is also there to support the development of digital economy. So if you always take that one year, two year view, of course you are gonna be very pessimistic. And pessimistic people can be right sometimes, but they can, not always be successful in the long term. There's a saying it goes that way. So when we take a seven year, eight year, 10 year view, we believe that the winning side is still on our side. So that's what also keeps us still motivated and excited about being here and investing here and working with uh, exceptional founders here. Um, I think she's 100% spot on. I say that to invest in Africa, in the long term, you have to forget Africa of today. It's hard when you are living through it, but you have to forget what it is today. Many people forget that um, six, five, six years ago, you had to pay 150K to web pay and interswitch before you could, before you could um, collect payments online. Today, if you're a developer that started developing in the last four years, you don't even know what that means. So, so much progress can be made when we we think about things in a, in a long term, with a long term view. If we think about certain things that we still have going for us, um, there's a young population, people born in the internet that would have purchasing power now. They are going to do all things online first. They're going to live in cities. Who is going to build things for them? Um, so you need to have that long term, that long term view. Forget Nigeria or Africa of today. I think of what something looks like seven to 10 years from now. Just to inform because I know there are a lot of founders and a lot of team members of startups in the audience. The reason that we're talking about seven to eight and have that capacity is because funds typically run on 10 year cycles. So it's the first three to five years you're actively investing in companies and the second five years you are, ex so 
you take cash and exchange it for equity, that's the first five years, and the second five years, you take that equity and sell it to somebody else or in an acquisition or a later stage investor, and then you ideally make your money back and add a profit. And so we have the cap capacity. So when you're going to VC funds and you're thinking about those cycles, if you are trying to build in the long term as well, and that's not for everybody. Some people, you have a one-year turnaround. Some people, you just need cash. You need debt for the next 12 months, for the next 24 months. Think about the duration of, of time where you're going to need capital, where you're going to start generating outsized revenues and profits. And that should inform the type of capital that you're even raising. So yes, for us investors, the first three years, I'm like, go figure out your product. Go identify your, your key team members. Like, go off into the sunset, work on stuff. There won't be a, a crazy ton of expectations the first year, the first you know, 18 months. I may be wrong, but for us. But only after that, like years, Three, four, five is when we're still when we're seriously looking to the business to be clearly scaling, reaching that you know high growth potential. So something also to keep in mind. Yeah, I'll just wrap up um, on that note. I think for me, it's just being in Lagos and seeing all the problems that exist today. Um, it just shows the amount of opportunities that exist, and I think. Venture capital was created to fund innovation. And so that's the most exciting part for me. You know, when I go into those pitch calls and I hear these like amazing ideas of things and products that I would use if it was built well, um, that's what excites me because there's so much more potential um, on the continent. So yeah. Well, I think um, my advice doesn't really, it doesn't really change, right? Is, is trying to build, build something of value. Um, and focus on those positive unit economics, right? In a bull market, selling $10 project, a $10 product for $9, you will grow, right? But at what, at what cost? So focus on that early bottom line, focus on those customers, focus on those positive unit economics because your best source of funding will still come from, from those customers that, that trust you and you're building for. And for the investors is, um, we are just rolling dice. Now God, they bring exit. <laughs> Uh, I would say we may be in a down market, but founders still hold your integrity and you can still hold investors backing your company to the same level of integrity. If somebody is coming to your business with crazy terms, trying to take 50%, 60% or whatever, and it doesn't feel right, don't take the money. Wait until you find the right partner, because this is not a short-term play. This is, a as we just described, it's a potentially 10-year play. And you're going to be stuck with that person that you see how they act when the chips are down. The people that you want to work with are the people in this market who are still giving you fair terms, who are still treating you with respect, who are still look having real conversations and trying to help you. So be thoughtful and don't just give in because we're having a rough time. It will turn back up. These things happen in cycles. Just be patient. Who well, I agree with everything Olumide and Maya has said. The one point I'll add is just building a product people need. Um, so I'm always excited when I speak to founders and it's almost they don't have capacity to meet all their customers' um, needs. And I think that's indicative of just the potential of the company. So being a bit maybe more flexible with receiving feedback, iterating on your product, what you start with oftentimes is never what you end with. And just being receptive to that, I think, would, would be great for you. I think all the panelists have said it all very well. Um, just echoing on the point that if you are crazily, crazily solving for a real problem, the reward will come. So it's a matter of time that when it will come, but it will come. So thanks, uh, Delapo, Maya, Lumide, Olivia, for um, what uh, I hope is a very interesting, insightful panel. And thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to Tech Cabal for hosting this event. <laughs>